Uh, first thing I'd like to do is, as we start all our meetings, uh, the Pledge of Allegiance. So if you would please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now the pledge to Texas flag. At this time, I would like to have any of our elected officials uh, please come around uh, through the, to the hall, please. Come around the back and, and come up on stage and introduce yourselves. And this is for all the officials who are newly elected, all the officials who are here for elected officials. It's on. Again. It's on now. <laughs> Hello, I'm Commissioner Hale. You're a real elected county commissioner for President Three. Thank you all so much for helping Cobb County set the example across the state. 76% voted, and we had the highest percentage of turnout by Republicans in the state. Candy Noble, and I'm honored to serve you for a second term in the Texas House. My name is John Lumber, day number one, as your seat six for the Fairy Town Council. So glad to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, good evening, Ricardo Loy, uh, council uh, member, seat for you, also your member for Good evening, everyone. Greg Custer. I'm your new councilman for C2. Thank you for your vote. Appreciate it. And good evening. I am your mayor, Henry Lester. I will be running for re-election next year. One more time. <laughs> One more time. So, um, and it's a little early to start, but I'm starting now. <laughs> Thank you all for coming out. We had a huge turnout in Fairview. I love to see that. I mean, this is what this is all about. Coming out and vote and making your choices. So thank you all for doing that. God bless. Uh, as I mentioned, we've got uh, a lot of business to try to get into this evening. So uh, based upon the bylaws that were passed two months ago, right, uh, it is this wonderful time of the year that we elect the officers to serve for next year's board, okay? Uh, I'd like to thank all of you. I've had the pleasure of being president of this organization for the last four years. Uh, I thank you for all of, all of your encouragement. And uh, based upon the, uh, the new bylaws, okay, no individual can serve in any office for more than four years. So uh, this year, uh, what, we, what we've done in order to be able to make sure that we don't turn over the entire board in one election is we broke in the election into two segments. And the first segment is the election of club officers for a one-year term. I would like to have these individuals please come up on stage so that you can put a uh, face with a name, please. Can someone get Philip from the outside? He's on the bank. His bank or our bank? Okay. okay. Is, he, is he going to the men's bank or the ladies? <laughs> Ron Samuels, who is running for director of membership, unfortunately is out of town. Uh, but again, due to the requirement that we have in order to be able to elect the board at our November meetings, uh, we will proceed with this slate. 
Uh, Philip, uh, is it all the money you've been collecting that uh, is making you walk so gingerly? <laughs> And these individuals uh, have been nominated by the nominating committee, okay? Uh, as you know, in the last couple of meetings, we've asked if anyone else uh, wanted to run for any of these offices. So these are the individuals. We've got <laughs> Clayton Barnes, Joan Van Fleet, and Philip LaRose, and again, we'll have Ron Samuels. I'll entertain a motion from the, uh, from the membership uh, to go ahead and vote on them, please. Second, please. All in favor? Aye. Thank you very much. Any opposed? Congratulations to your next one year term. <laughs> and now I'd like to have all the uh, all the nominees who are running for uh, the two year term of office. Please come up on stage. Unfortunately, uh, there we go. And these are the nominees by the nominating committee. We've requested any additional nominees. Uh, these are the individuals. Uh, Jack P. Simone uh, for president, Tim Bork for secretary. Our uh, new position that we have is the historian and parliamentarian, Maureen Everett. And all of you will know our, uh, our director of legislative and campaign activities, Ben Brown. Got a vote, a nominee uh, for the, to, the floor to accept the nominations. Second, please. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you very much. Congratulations. <laughs> we now have a, a message from our sheriff. Um, I'm sure that all of you have been anxiously. Uh, listening to the news and seeing some of the things that are going on around the country. Uh, we asked the sheriff to give us his viewpoint. He tried try to be here, unfortunately, and of course, uh, pulled away for another uh, meeting this, this evening that he couldn't get away from, but decided to record for us. Uh, all my message finds all of you at the Republican Club of Heritage Ranch all doing well and feeling healthy. I wish I could join you in person there tonight. But I've been placed in quarantine by the county epidemiologist after being uh, exposed in close proximity to a person who was sick with COVID-19 last Monday during the execution of a search warrant out near Blue Ridge. The good news is we got two cartel bad guys and 15 kilos of methamphetamines off of the street. Uh, this week, as you might imagine, has been filled with lots of writing and many Zoom meetings. I was asked by Joan to speak to you folks tonight for a few minutes about the security posture for us here in Collin County following the elections. As you all know, there's been much concern about civil unrest as uh, we've seen demonstrations and riots carried out by Antifa and other radical groups across the country uh, over the past many months. While we are in a constant state of readiness here at the Collin County Sheriff's Office, the, the fact is that uh, we've not had any violence erupt from the many protesters that we've dealt with thus far. Uh, about one month ago, I activated the Fusion Center on a full-time basis. Um, our intelligence analysts and deputies, we monitor social media and we analyze any leads that come in um, regarding the security posture in the communities in about 12 you know, different counties across North Texas. Um, while we've uh, dealt with a number of Black Lives Matter protests, um, we've only really had two notable incidents where we deployed deputies uh, and where we were assisted by state troopers. One of these incidents is, was a threatened demonstration of our jail by Black Lives Matter activists because um, I had agreed to take into custody the Wolf City police officer who had been arrested for murder. 
um, and charged by the Hunt County District Attorney. Uh, when they found out that he was going to be in our jail, they decided to organize a protest in our parking lot. So what I instructed my staff to do in that case was to simply move every motor vehicle on the premises to an off-site location uh, down in our minimum facility. I had them lock the doors and turn out the lights so when these folks showed up to protest, uh, nobody was home. And after about 15 minutes, they loaded up and left. So that was, uh, we, were, we were glad to see that happen. The, uh, the second incident was with a radical extremist type group known as the Boogaloos. Uh, they came to Collin County and protested the ruling of one of our district judges in a family law matter. Uh, they like to tell folks that they stand against tyranny. And apparently anything connected to the government seemed to be uh, tyrannical to them. But at any rate, 34 of these individuals wearing their Hawaiian shirts and uh, body armor and AR-15 slung around their necks, uh, got together and marched through a neighborhood and ended up in the front of the house of this particular district judge here in Collin County. Now that incident ended peacefully. Um, while we were out of sight, we had uh, more than a sufficient response ready uh, to deal with them if it became necessary. But in this circumstance, uh, I did have the opportunity and the occasion to speak with, uh, if you will, nose to nose with uh, their leader in front of the courthouse. And I explained to him that no one here was impressed or intimidated or frightened and that uh, Collin County is a place where we respect the rule of law. Um, they decided what they do is pack it up and, and leave. Uh, about a day or two later. So we haven't had them come back, and of course we learned a lot of great lessons from it. Um, essentially what I want to let you know is that all is well here in Collin County, and we have a very well-trained contingent of over 80 deputies uh, that can be fielded to meet any threat, and our intelligence analysts and our apparatus is up and working. I realize that in the wake of the elections, there are those on the left who all of a sudden are waving an American flag and preaching unity. Um, I also understand that some of these folks at the very same time, in their other hand, have a rock they're holding behind their back. We'll see what happens in the coming weeks. But the, well, here's the bottom line, folks. We're realists. And as realists, what we know is, is that we'll always be prepared. So I want each of you to know that things are peaceful and safe here in Collin County, and that we're committed to keep it that way. I also want you to know that it's my privilege to serve as your sheriff. God bless each and every one of you, and I hope to see you in person soon.
Thank you very much, Mike. I believe that uh, our servers are going to be starting with uh, our plate of dinner this evening, so if you'll bear with us. Uh, this will give you a couple seconds to be able to run uh, to the bar. For those of you who would like to provide us some wine or a drink. And, uh, Uh, we have an unexpected guest uh, who, due to some faulty information we gave her, uh, arrived a little late. She can't be here too long because her husband uh, has a problem. But uh, she wanted she, she, want, she wanted to, uh, to come by and talk and address uh, the membership of the Republican uh, Public Heritage Ranch. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Judge Henry Patterson to us. tonight. 
a gentleman that has devoted a lot of his time and energy to the Electoral College. You're getting a handout. Sometimes it's dangerous to hand it out before he speaks because you need to listen to him. But this is a backup and also a map. And it has to do with the valuable Electoral College. It was with wise thinking that our forefathers put this into play and many people are trying to destroy it. Am I right, Fred? <laughs> okay. A little bit about our speaker, just a little bit. He is the founder and executive director of Save Our States. He has served as executive vice president of the Oklahoma Council of Public Affairs. Yes, he came to us from Oklahoma tonight, and he's going back tonight. So we feel very privileged. Also, the Freedom Foundation and the legal policy analyst for the Heritage Foundation. He is the producer of a feature-length documentary, Safeguard, an Electoral College Story. He's the author of why we must defend the Electoral College, and he'll talk about that when he speaks. And he is a contributor to the Heritage Guide to the Constitution and One Nation Under Arrest. He earned his JD from, the universe, from George Mason University School of Law and the BA degree in government from Claremont McKenna College. And now, I would like you to warmly welcome Trent England. Great to come down south of the Red River to what you know we up there call South Oklahoma. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I promise I won't mess with Texas anymore. Uh, I'm not even. I'm not originally from Oklahoma. I'm originally from Seattle, right? So that's uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's you can only imagine. Uh, everything you see on the news is true, um, and then some. But um, I mean, assuming you brought the right channel. Um, but uh, I do want to talk to you about the Electoral College. I want to do a couple of things here. I, I want to just make sure we're all on the same page with what the Electoral College is, what it really is. And then talk about why we have an Electoral College. Uh, because this is uh, the, the most common attack on the Electoral College really revolves around why we have it. Right? And the allegation that somehow it's connected to slavery or racism or something like that, it's very easy to disprove. Um, if, if, you, if you go through the history, so I'm going to take you through the history very briefly after we talk about what it is, and then I want to talk about this attack on the Electoral College. The handouts really focus on that because that is something I find almost no one is aware of. Despite the fact that it is almost 75% of the way to actually hijacking the Electoral College, and effectively nullifying it in favor of a direct popular election. So we're going we're gonna to close with that. And along the way, I'm, I'm going to try to you know, mention, because we're not doing Q&A here tonight, uh, I'm going to try to mention uh, what's in the news uh, as far as, as the question of what, you know, what, what is the power of state legislators and the electors when you have a, a contested election. Uh, so we'll, we'll also try to make sure I touch on those things too. Uh, but what is the Electoral College? Right, so the Constitution says, each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof shall direct a number of 
electors, right? This is in Article 2 of the Constitution, second paragraph, if you want to look, look for it later, and then in the 12th Amendment, which in 1804 made some uh, relatively minor changes to, to how the Electoral College process works. Uh, but the Electoral College is, is sort of like a pop-up Congress. Every state has a number of presidential electors equal to its representation in the U.S. House and Senate. Right, and so uh, and so every state has at least three electors, and then the, the biggest state, California, they have 53 members of the House. So 53 plus two, they have 55 electors, and everybody else is somewhere in between. I, I feel like I ought to know, but how many House districts are there in Texas? 36. So you have 38 electoral votes, right? Uh, so so it's based on it's based on the congressional math. Right, and this is this is math that gives the smallest states a little bit of a boost, but ultimately it's also you know goes up for, for bigger states. But it contains the election within states, and it gives power to state legislatures to determine how those presidential electors are chosen. Which of course is why you have people asking, talking about that power right now. Right, can a state legislature step in and say we're going to directly appoint presidential electors? States used to do that, although it hasn't happened since 1876. Actually, when Colorado joined the Union in 1876, Colorado is called a centennial state because they joined the, the Union at our centennial, um, they spent a lot of money on their uh, writing their constitution and having an election to ratify it. They had already gone through all that that year. And when it came around to the presidential election, the legislature just said, look, we don't have the money to hold another statewide election to choose our presidential electors. And so they did what many states had, had done around the beginning of our country. They just chose their state's presidential electors. Right? So this is, it's not controversial that states can't do that, but we'll maybe talk a little bit more about, about how that process would work if a state has already called an election. Of course, today, every state holds an election statewide to choose that state's presidential electors. And almost every state chooses their electors winner take all, right? So you all vote in Texas, and whichever candidate gets the most votes in Texas gets all of Texas's electoral votes. The only two states that don't do it that way are Maine and Nebraska. They allocate one presidential elector from each congressional district, and the, the other two then statewide. Right, so states, again, I, I gave you the constitutional language, right? The, the founders gave this power to state legislatures and said, look, you figure out how best to represent your own state in the electoral college. Right, so this is, this is all about what we call federalism, right? This is all about our system of states in the constitution pushing power down and to the states, and in this case, very specifically to state legislatures. Now people say, well, who are these presidential electors? How, in a room like this, probably a lot of people who, who know exactly how the system works. How many people were at the, I, I don't know, did you have a, an in-person state Republican convention this year? So how many people were there at the state? Or how many people, kind of, how many people have been to a, a statewide party convention in a presidential year? I'm sure we've got some folks around here. Right, so I have back in my original home state of Washington. Uh, and this is where presidential electors come from, right? Presidential electors, Texas's electors, are people who were nominated by the Republican Party at the state convention. And because Donald Trump got the most votes in the state of Texas, right, then the Republican Party's slate of electors are chosen. That has to happen under federal law by December 8th. And on December 14th, which, you know, nerds like me like to call Electoral College Day. On December 14th, the electors meet in each state capital and they cast the actual votes for president. And so on December 14th, we'll know who the president elect is. <laughs> Don't tell CNN. Uh, no, right? I mean, it, I mean it's, it's, you know, it, there's a whole other, other side to this debate. But legally speaking, right, legally speaking, there is no presidential elect until at least December 14th. And really, it's, it's January 6th when the new Congress will assemble and actually count those ballots, right? And so, and so really, the election is over on January 6th, right? When Congress, uh, when Congress counts the ballots and, uh, and actually declares a winner. That's how this process works. And it's, I mean, to me, it, it really is just shameless of people in the media to ignore the fact that 
And legally, there's no question that what I said is true, right? I mean, legally, there is, there literally is no president-elect until, you know, you could say December 14th, because everybody will sort of, will know at that point how all the state's electors voted. But there's really no president-elect until Congress counts those votes. Congress certifies the election. And, you know, and another sort of frustration, personal frustration of mine as a real constitutional law nerd, um, is that, you know, everybody talks about the courts in this process when you have a contested election. But who does, con who, who does the Constitution give the power to? It, it does not give the power to the courts. It gives the power to state legislatures, and then it gives the power to Congress. And, uh, and that's by design, right? When people say, people look back like at the 1876 election, which was the most contested presidential election in our history. Um, it, it went until two days shy of Inauguration Day, and Inauguration Day back then was in March. Right, so I mean, you, you mean nothing, you know, I mean, 2000, you know, was nothing, this is nothing, 1876 was crazy. And, um, and uh, uh, people look back at that, which was refereed by Congress. Congress created a committee. They did make the Chief Justice the chairman of the committee. Uh, but people look back at that and say, oh, it was, it was a political process. Well, gee, was the, that's, the Constitution creates a bunch of political processes, right? It, James Madison and George Washington were not surprised. It, you know, would not be surprised that legislatures are political, that Congress is political, right? They knew this. And, what they, and they knew that a, an election process is inherently political. And so in, in their mind, better to have the political branches figure these things out than to politicize the courts. Which is interesting. I mean, we just don't, we tend not to really think that way anymore. And I think oftentimes we buy into this argument that, well, these processes shouldn't be political. Well, you know, they're political. That's just the way it is. Okay, sorry, that's, I'm, I'm going a little off my notes. But, uh, uh, so, so that's the, the electoral college, right? It's this process created in the Constitution, delegated power to the states, exercised by the political parties nominating people, every state holding an election to choose the presidential electors. They vote in December, the votes are counted in January. You, you got it, right? Why? Why do we do it this way? You know, some people say no other country in the world does it this way. And of course, I mean, if you really focus on the, the details of the Electoral College, that's true, right? But, but there's all kinds of parliamentary systems that you can say, well, this parliamentary system is totally different from any others because of you know, a handful of features that it has or something. Do you know, there, there are two countries that wrote, two major countries that wrote constitutions in the 20th century. Uh, West Germany, now, now that constitution effectively governs all of Germany, and India, the two major countries that wrote new constitutions uh, India in 1950 and you know, West Germany before that, uh, just a couple of years before that. You know both of those countries have electoral college type systems to choose their national executive, right? And India is specifically modeled off of ours, although it is a little bit different. Banks, both of these are far more complicated than ours are. And they're also a little bit less democratic than ours are. Uh, both of them actually sort of involve state legislatures. They, they use state legislators casting votes directly. Um, as, a, as a part of the process. And that's as far as I'm going to go into that, because as I say, it's super complicated. But, I mean, look, people say no other country does this, right? The, the two major democracies that were refounded in the 20th century both do this, right? And every parliamentary country around the world is a two-step process to choose their executive, right? To choose their prime minister. The Electoral College is not some crazy outlier. And people say, I mean, you hear this all the time in the media. Well, no other country would have a candidate who got, who didn't get the most votes win. It's exactly what happened in the last Canadian election in 2019, right? It happens all the time in parliamentary systems when a coalition is formed and it doesn't include the, the party that got the most votes, which, which happens, it doesn't happen every time, but it, it happens, right? There, there's nothing unique about our electoral college and compared to many of the, in, you know, in, in this sense, and compared to many of these systems, it's far more democratic. But why do we have it? Why do we have an electoral college? Well, when the founders got together at the Constitutional Convention in May of 1787, they had a rough draft constitution. It's called the Virginia Plan. And the Virginia Plan called for a parliamentary system, which made sense, right? That was, you know, that's what, what was familiar, right? And it's still familiar today. Congress would have elected the President of the United States. Nobody liked it. Pretty much everybody looked at that and said, 
The problem with a parliamentary system, and this is true today, is that you don't have an independent executive, right? You're, the president would be Congress's lackey, would be subject to all kinds of congressional politics, if not corruption, right? They wanted an independent executive, right? The American founders, frankly, they didn't want weak government. They wanted a limited government that within its proper sphere was powerful and, and effective, right? That could act because their biggest problem was uh, was the fact that they still had a bunch of European powers who were hoping to come and have you know and, and have some authority on in North America, right? So they wanted an executive that was effective. That pretty much ruled out a parliamentary system, and and so you know then they start talking about all these other ideas. They talk about a popular vote. Um, nobody really likes that either, for for a couple of reasons that I'll get to in just a minute. But they, I mean, these guys. These guys were out of the box thinkers. They talked about all kinds of crazy things, um, including my favorite, which was they said, "Well, you know, a parliamentary system. If you have, if you let all the members of Congress vote, right, then then you're going to have that congressional politics and corruption. <laughs> what if what if you had them you had them uh, you had a lottery, and so you chose a, a subset of members of Congress, and then well, then you still have a problem, right? You still have, maybe they get bought off or something." You choose them, and then as soon as they're chosen, you lock them in a room, and they can't come out until they choose the president. I mean, this is actually brought up at the Constitutional Convention. There was no debate on this. It like, you know, flew like a lead balloon, right? But, uh, but somebody proposed this at the Constitutional Convention. Um, and they, they talked about all kinds of different ideas. The governors do it, state legislators do it. They didn't want any group of existing politicians to choose the president, because that compromises that, that independence. And so ultimately they said, look, why don't we delegate this power to the states and let state legislatures figure out how to represent their own state, right? And so as I say, it's, you know, it's based on a parliamentary model, right? But it, it eliminates the role, the role of existing politicians in that process because you cannot be a federal office holder and also be a presidential elector. Um, and actually, the other thing, I keep mentioning 1876, like everything weird happened in 1876. The only time an elector was ever thrown out was the state of Oregon, uh, actually one of their electors was an assistant postmaster. And after the election, somebody points this out, and, and he was eliminated because he was a federal official. And back then, you know, the Constitution was like a real thing that people followed. And so they said, well, you, you can't do this. Um, so, so why did they not just do a national popular vote, right? Why not just a direct election? Some people say, well, it just would have been too hard. You know, they had horses and stuff like that. And, uh, it's, it's not true. It, you know, you think about it, they were holding popular elections across the state of Georgia, across the Commonwealth of Virginia. These are big places geographically. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it, it was not easy to hold an election um, at the time. but. For each state to hold its own election and then add those totals together, it would have taken a little bit of time. It's not impossible, right? People who say, oh, they, it's just impossible. No, it's just not true. And, and nobody said that. Nobody made that claim. Um, they did worry that people just wouldn't have information about the candidates. Uh, and and it, this is where sometimes the founders are accused of being elitist, but I think the opposite is sort of true. I mean, they lived at a time when the country was small enough that when people were voting for members of the U.S. House, right, people typically actually knew who they were voting for, right? They knew the choices personally, or at least indirectly personally, right? And so, you know, it's not that, as people say, well, today with the news media and social media and all this, we've got all the information we want. Well, the reality is no, we don't, right? Almost none of us know anything personally about the people we're voting for for president. The founders' objections is still true today. It's just that once you get as big as our country is today, there's nothing you can do about it. It's just a limitation of being a really big country. Uh, but at the time, they thought, you know, if we can have some kind of a two-step process, maybe the people who are casting that final vote will have more information, right? That, again, it's not crazy, it's not elitist, it's very practical. But the real, the, the real factor that stopped them from creating a direct election was this. James Madison gets up and gives this kind of pivotal speech in late July. He says, look, we've decided we're not going to do a parliamentary system. Madison says, I like a popular vote, right? I, I like a direct popular election. It, it, it's simple, it's easy, right? You can, you can understand it. 
But Madison says, the problem is, some states are very big, some states are very small, right? If you do a popular election, a handful of big states, and he specifically mentions Virginia, which was his, his own state, and New York, and Pennsylvania, right? If th those three states, he says, if, if they all decide on who they want, everybody else is going to be left out. And that's not going to be something that will necessarily change over time, right? That's something that could be locked in. And you could have a system where a handful of, of big states or big cities control who becomes president and everybody else is left out. And you know, Madison understood for a political system to, to be effective in the long run, everybody has to believe in their opportunity to go out and make change, right? Not a guarantee that you're going to win because you know, that, that's impossible. But a guarantee that, that you can try to win, that you have a chance, that if you persuade enough the people around you, that you can make a difference, right? And if you don't have that, right, then a political system becomes brittle and, and entropy, right? The forces that pull us apart become more powerful than the forces that pull us together. So Madison says, we, we, need, we need to work out this other system, this two-step process. And at the end of the Constitutional Convention, Madison is the guy, apparently, it happened in a committee, so there's not good, good notes from the committee, but uh, the, the second-hand accounts say Madison is the guy in that committee who actually puts pen to paper and designs the Electoral College. Right, and you know, the important thing about that is, it has nothing to do with racism. And it really has nothing to do with slavery. Right? People say, well, the three-fifths compromise gave southern states more power, and that flows into the Electoral College. That is true. Right? It, gave, it gave the southern states a, a slight advantage that never tipped the scales in any election, as, as far as you can definitively tell. Um, never tipped the scales in any election. But remember, what were those big states? Right? The big states were, yeah, sure, Virginia, but also Pennsylvania, and also New York. Right, those were the states that, uh, that, that that would potentially uh, benefit from a direct election. Right, one in the south, one in the middle, one in the, in the north, and it was small states, particularly small states in the north, that were the biggest advocates of the convention for an electoral college system. Right, the idea that it was some kind of racist plot is just absurd. And the the major alternative at the beginning of the convention was a parliamentary system, which would have brought the three fifths compromise. Into the, into the presidential selection system just the same way, right? So th th this whole idea that it had some connection to slavery, it's just, it's just not true. And when you look at how the Electoral College has worked throughout our history, check my time, there we go. Uh, the Electoral College has worked to protect the cause of civil rights far more than it's done anything like the opposite. Uh, in in the, the, uh, the one election before the Civil War, where the Electoral College really made the decisive difference, or really not having a popular vote, uh, made the decisive difference, was the election of 1824, um, one of only two elections that went to the House of Representatives, because in the Electoral College, if you don't have a majority, then the House of Representatives chooses the president. That election deadlocked because there were multiple candidates, uh, Andrew Jackson got the most popular votes, but John Quincy Adams wound up winning the vote in the House. And the important thing about that is, John Quincy Adams was the most anti-slavery president elected before the Civil War, right? So the one election where all this made the biggest difference, um, at least in the pre-Civil War period, um, was an election where it benefited a, a, basically an abolitionist candidate over Andrew Jackson, who was pro-slavery. And it turned out to be very anti-electoral college when he lost that election, right? Um, after the Civil War, the, the, electoral, the electoral college, we actually had a series of elections after the Civil War very analogous to what we've seen over these last 20 years, right? People say, our country's never been this divided. I, like, I, I probably say, I was going to say, you know, it's really frustrating, but I probably said that, right? It's easy to say that. You know, in my lifetime, our country's never been this divided. And that's probably true for everybody. But our country has been far more divided, right, after the Civil War. Um, and what was the effect of the Electoral College in these elections? It had a powerful force bringing the nation back together. And you can see it in the two elections where the candidate who received the most popular votes did not win the Electoral College, right? I mean, what, what have we seen over the last 20 years? We've seen two elections like that. What did they see after the Civil War? 1876 and 1888, two elections like that. 
right? So what, what happened? Uh, well, the, the Democratic Party, very strong in the South, incredibly strong in the Deep South, right? Uh, they, would, they would get uh, over 80% in South Carolina, they would get over 70% in four, five, six other states, right? So what happens when, you, when you're a regional political party and you're super popular in that region, and by the way, I mean, it, the, the vote fraud at that time, and it you know, wasn't just the South, it wasn't just Democrats, but in the South, among the Democrats, the, the vote fraud was incredible, right? I mean, there are places where they would not print the Republicans' name on the ballot. This actually this happened to Lincoln, actually, you know, even before, right? You know, people, people would say, well, you know, the Republicans didn't get any votes in our precinct. Well, you know, they, they vote right on the ballot, right? They couldn't get any votes. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, you think that the many voting machines are bad. Uh, so, so the, the Democrats learned an important lesson in these two elections, right? Which was they could, I mean, they could fire up the political machine in South Carolina and Georgia uh, and North Carolina and Louisiana as much as they wanted. But they could not win the presidency unless they could win some states in the North, some of the new states in the Midwest and in the West. Right? They had to do that only because of the Electoral College. If you had a popular vote system, right? they, they could have worked their political machine in the South to, to maybe even guarantee their role on the presidency. It, because, you know, just, again, because of the, some of the dynamics in the South. And so, uh, uh, so what happens, right? The Democrats start running only candidates from the North. They start doing heavy outreach to groups that Republicans were ignoring in the North. Right? And, and who were those groups? I mean, particularly it was, it was immigrants uh, who were Catholic from either Germany or Ireland, right? America was having a big influx of, of immigration from those places. Right now, think about how weird that is, right? The Democratic Party, after the Civil War, had the Ku Klux Klan as its terrorist wing, right? I mean, and that party was going to Catholic immigrants in the North and, like, asking for their, that's not a natural thing to do. Right? That's something that they only did because of the Electoral College, because of this two-step election process. Right? And this is exactly why India has a system like this. It's exactly why Germany has a system like this. Because in a big, diverse country, you do not want your regions to become solidified, ossified, and at odds with each other. You have to have some force that pulls people together and forces your, your regions you know, your political party that's strong in one region to be constantly reaching out to people in other areas, right? I mean, and what's the effect of this? I mean, the Democratic Party does eventually um, grow into a major national coalition party once again, right? Because the Electoral College forced them to. And, and actually, if you zoom forward, the greatest defender of the Electoral College in the 20th century was the descendant of some of those Irish Catholic immigrants who were brought into the Democratic Party in the late 19th century, and that was, that was JFK. When John Kennedy was in the United States Senate in the 1950s, he was a staunch defender of the Electoral College. At a time when you had people trying to get rid of the Electoral College, including for this reason, some of his fellow Democrats wanted to get rid of the Electoral College, and they said why. They said, if we get rid of the Electoral College, we won't have to pay attention to blacks and to Jews in our political coalition. That's what they said. I mean, they, said these, they were forthright about this, right? And they were right, right? I mean, still, the Electoral College, even in the 1950s, was forcing the Democratic Party to pay attention to voters in states like New York and Massachusetts, and not just pay attention to voters in the South, right? This is a powerful force in our politics, and whether it's, whether it's affecting elections like it did in 2000 and in 2016 or not, it's still there in every presidential election that we have. Right, forcing the political parties to reach out. You, you've got to be strong in some you know, parts of the country. You've got to start out with a base right? in politics. If you don't have a base to start with, you're kind of out of luck. But then you've got to reach beyond that base and try to win people over in parts of the country where you're not already that popular. This is a really powerful incentive for good. But if you are a regional political party, it's really frustrating. Right? Andrew Jackson didn't like the Electoral College when it cost him the election. 
right? The Democrats, after 1876 and after 1888, didn't like the Electoral College when it cost them the election. Now, back then, it's easy to recognize them as a regional political party because you just look at the map, right? It's the South and then it's the rest of the country. Today, it's a little bit harder unless you look at the map by county, right? You look at the red blue map by county, it's pretty easy to see. Right? The Democratic Party has become a regional political party where they get huge shares of the vote in major cities, in major urban areas, particularly on the coast and particularly in California, where I used to live. Right? And uh, I mean, what's, what's the population of, of the Dallas metro? Anybody know? Six million. About seven or eight million. So I used to live in LA County in California, like outside of. Los Angeles proper, but in the, the LA sprawl. Just Los Angeles County, which is just a piece of the LA sprawl, of the LA metro, just LA County has 10 million people in it, right? I mean, I mean, you know, the, the scale of the cities on our coast, especially the LA, San Diego metroplex, and then the tri-state area around New York City, right? Those are huge areas. And when you're extremely popular in those areas and then a bunch of other cities, you are a regional political party, and the Electoral College makes your life more difficult because it was created to do that, right? This is why we have it. This is why James Madison wanted us to have an Electoral College because he didn't want one population-dense part of the country, whether it's all in one re you know, identifiable region or whether it's scattered around the country, to control the executive branch of government, right? But it's understandable for, for folks who are on the losing side of those contests, like in 2016, to want to change the rules, right? At least, at least some of them. I mean, I, do, I will say, I work with state legislators all around the country working to defend the Electoral College, and there are folks on the Democrat side who recognize that it's better for their political party to not try to change the rules and to try to actually go and win over more Americans. Right? Mostly these are Democrats from rural areas who, who don't want their party to move even further to the left. But, but can they do it? Right? People, people tell me all the time, well, they can't get rid of the Electoral College. You have to amend the Constitution. Everybody thought that was true um, up until 2001. Um, but when I first got interested in the Electoral College back in the 1990s, those, all the fights that had come before were constitutional amendment fights. Uh, but in 2001, after Al Gore lost the year before, three liberal law professors came up with a different idea. And you've got to give them a lot of credit. They went to the Constitution. They went to that language that I quoted before. Each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors. Right? And they said, well, wait a second. State legislatures choose how to appoint presidential electors. What if you got a bunch of state legislatures to say, we're going to, going to ignore how the people in our own state vote. The Constitution does not explicitly say that they have to pay attention to what the people of their state want. It's just assumed, right? I mean, that's, you would think that that would be the political instinct for state legislators is, you know, to, to pay attention to their own voters. And they said, what if, what if you could get state legislators to pass a law that says, we will choose our state's presidential electors based on the national popular vote, right? We'll just force the Electoral College process to rubber stamp the national popular vote result. I mean, this, this, my friends, is very clever. I mean, it is. Frankly, it's an idea so dumb, James Madison never worried about it, right? The, I mean, the idea that state legislators would give away their state's power in presidential elections, it takes a lot of, you know, political desire for power or ideology or something Right to, to get to that point. But they, they found a fellow named John Cosa who lives out in the San Francisco area who invented the scratch-off lottery ticket back in the 1970s. Of all. He invented the, sort of the mathematical algorithm behind it. Um, so this guy wins on every scratch ticket. And he was a, he was a big supporter of Al Gore's. He's a big supporter of Nancy Pelosi's. And, and, uh, and they, they got together with, with uh, John Cosa and created the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact and a campaign funded by tens of millions of dollars to go around state legislators and, uh, and lobby them to do this. And typically what they would do, uh, and, and what they still do today, 
they get most of the votes on the left by default, right? Like folks on the left, you know, after 2000, especially after 2016, you say, I've got a way to mess up the electoral college, and they're in for the most part. Uh, but mostly what they, what they did, they hired a, a handful of former Republican officials, uh, the former chairman of the Michigan Republican Party, a former California state senator uh, who's, who's a Republican, uh, Michael Steele, who used to run the RNC, uh, almost ran it right into the ground, uh, frankly. But uh, they hired these folks, and they would take Republican state legislators on fancy trips, or, you know, oftentimes like Hawaii or Puerto Rico or places like that, and they would put them, they, they bring only Republicans, they bring only Republican spokesmen, and they would tell them that, no, no, this would help Republicans win elections. Which, you know, is, I mean, to me, it seems kind of crazy, especially after 2000, 2016. Uh, but, you know, they, they actually would get traction with some Republicans to do this, and they started passing this in states. Now, now the only states they passed it in are, are blue states. Uh, but they have got some Republican legislators to go along with this, and they've actually got Republican legislatures in a few states to pass it through one chamber or the other, uh, but they've never gotten it all the way through. Uh, but this is a very savvy, very well-funded campaign. The materials that were passed down include a couple pages of just descriptions of what's wrong with this. People always ask me for talking points. So the, the, the one page is really talking points. What is wrong with it? this national popular vote proposal, or any proposal to do away with the Electoral College. Um, there's another page that, that, that kind of describes the national popular vote, describes what we do at Save Our States a little bit more, and then there's a map. And on the map, you can see that the states that are dark blue are states that have passed this, that both chambers of the legislature have passed it, governors have signed it, um, the national popular vote is, well, is on the books in those states. The states in lighter blue which includes some Republican states. And by the way, Oklahoma was before I moved there. But, uh, but it includes some Republican states where one chamber or the other in the legislature actually passed this at one time, right? Just sort of showing you how dangerous this is. Because if you add those numbers together, you can see, right? If they were just able to go back to states where they, they've actually passed it through at least one chamber of the legislature and get all those states to do it, they would have 270 plus electoral votes. I think they'd have 274. The, the, this national popular vote compact kicks in when they get it passed in states that control 270 electoral votes. And at that point, if it went into effect, if the court didn't strike it down, and again, it's not obviously unconstitutional. I, I, think, I think there are some reasons why courts should strike it down. The con Constitution in Article 2 does not explicitly say that state legislatures have to pay attention to their own voters. Um, if they get to 270, it takes effect you would have a popular vote for president with no change to the Constitution, no national dialogue, right? They could do this by adding really a handful of more big states or, you know, uh, if, they, if they added, you know, eight or so medium-sized states, right? They could do this. So save our states. We work all around the country to stop this. I will say, when we started up in 2009, if you, you look at the national popular vote tra trajectory before that, they were on track to put that into effect before 2016. We started doing what we do and basically fought them to a draw within a couple of years. And, uh, uh, and, and they went through a number of years where they didn't win any states and people were telling me, Trent, you know, I think you won, I think you should go do something else. And, and uh, you know, we kept, we kept fighting, we kept the pressure on. Obviously 2016 happened and suddenly this became agenda item number one for the left. Eric Holder is constantly tweeting about this, organizing people about this. Folks on the left have raised a lot of money um, to, to push national popular vote. Uh, so we are, we are doing what we do all around the country. I'm really glad to be here and talk with you all about it. I, I will say, before I pop off the stage, so I, I brought some copies of, of my book. I think I have 15 copies here. Um, if, if anybody wants to make a contribution to what we do, obviously that's, that's how we do what we do. It's how we educate state legislators and the public. Um, if, if you donate whatever amount, just go online and do it. Don't give me money. Uh, <laughs> but you can go to our website and make a contribution there. I'd love to give you a copy of the book. And so you know, if you want to do that, you can wave your hand or come up and get it if, if there's any left later. But yeah, just a contribution of any amount to, to save our states, and that will really, really helps us. Um, to, to get out. We don't take legislators on fancy trips to Hawaii, by the way. 
I found that you know when you're on the side of truth, it's actually a little bit easier and more cost effective. Uh, the other thing you can do before I sit down, we have a documentary. It's uh, it's mentioned already. It's on Amazon Video. Um, so if you if you got Amazon Prime, you can watch it for free. If you don't, I think it's like three dollars. You can buy a DVD for six bucks. Safeguard an electoral college story. And I will tell you this: it's not it's not designed so much for all of you. You, you folks are in the know. Right? You, you folks are, are engaged in politics and, and you, know, you probably know your constitution. The documentary is really designed for folks who aren't in the know, who don't know so much. And it, it talks about, specifically about, how the Electoral College protects minority rights, um, you know, why it's, it's good for civil rights. It's a message designed especially for, for young Americans to see the benefit of this. A friend of mine just this morning on the phone told me, he has, a, he has a friend, he lives back in Alexandria, Virginia, he has a friend who works for NBC News. The guy's a hardcore Democrat. And he said, you know, I, I was scrolling through Amazon, I saw this documentary about the Electoral College. And I watched it, and this friend of mine is one of the experts who's in it. And he, the, the guy, his neighbor was so, he said, you're, you're in this documentary, I didn't know you were in a documentary. He said, I finally understand why we have an Electoral College and why it's so important, right? So. We are actually out there winning over people on the other side. So if you go watch Safeguard and Electoral College Story, share it with your friends, share it on social media, give it a good five-star review on Amazon, that's super helpful. Uh, but, uh, but, but we would love to partner with you to educate all Americans, and particularly state legislators, on why this is so important to our republic. So thank you all so much for what you do, and I'll hang out with you after this. Please, thank you. Democrats. 
So you can see, even behind Electoral College, there's a lot of Republican votes that were, were, were made and were making some inroads in some of the lower chambers in, in the states. U.S. Congress results uh, right now in the Senate, the Republicans are ahead by two. <laughs> there are two races in Georgia on January 5th that will determine the balance of power in the U.S. Senate. And if you like me and you get all kinds of email that says contribute to somebody for the race in Georgia, please do. They need contributions and help in Georgia. In the House, the current numbers that I saw today, the Democrats have passed the threshold of 218 votes. They're at 219. Well, what's interesting is you look at those 13 undecided votes, five or six of those should have been called already. Where if some of you remember Lee Zeldin, who's a congressman from New York, He's ahead like 75, 25 with 100% of the vote in and nobody's called in the race yet. I don't know why. There are about five or six of those from the 13 that are raising the field. There's one lady in Kansas who's leading by 40 votes. That will be a recount. So there'll be some, but the majority of those 13 are gonna be Republican. So it's going to be interesting to see the U.S. House with Ms. Pelosi not having a substantial majority. Uh, our Texas Senate delegation did not change. And I have to say that as a tongue-in-cheek. The numbers didn't change. Some of the people have changed. There are some races where the Republican was replaced with the Republican and vice versa. So, but we still have a pretty good majority in the U.S. House uh, as far as the Texas delegation goes. And I think with that, Joan, you get to do it on your introduction. <laughs> well, many of us were rather disappointed until now, but we don't know the final outcome with our dear president, and we're waiting to see. But we do have a lot to celebrate. And this is kind of the feel-good part of our, well, so was the Electoral College. We realize how much the Electoral College has contributed to our political system and how wise our forefathers were. But right now, we're going to concentrate on Texas. And we have as our final guest, a very fine lady who has been largely responsible for the huge Texas win around the state. Did this blue wave flow over Texas or not? No. It was stopped cold with all the monies that came in from California and every place else. They didn't get very far. And I hope they're discouraged because we never want to see them again. <laughs> but right now we have a lady to come speak with us. She is the vice chair of the Republican Party of Texas. As you're aware, every state has a Republican Party. And they all work together to try to bring about Republican wins. Well, Kate Park, uh, Kat Parks actually assumed her duties as the vice chair of the Republican Party of Texas in this summer. And those of us that were on the, uh, were delegates for the state uh, convention that really took place virtually, but um, she was elected at that time. But I'd like to say a few things about her and tell you how instrumental she has been and bring about, bringing about this huge Republican win in Texas. She has a, she's, uh, she believes in rugged individualism and the, the importance of education and the power of the grassroots. And that's who we are. 
We're struggling, we do the best we can, and we try to bring out the votes. She's passionate about growing the party, at which she has spent a lot of timeless energy growing the party, and the conviction of we the people. She, uh, in her past experience, has been a small business owner, a former university coach and college adjunct professor, and she's a certified emergency room nurse. She was the recipient of the Munisteri Award presented by our governor, Abbott, and the lieutenant governor, and the former Republican Party chair. And that's where I want to focus a little bit of attention because the thing she did before becoming the vice chair of the Republican Party of Texas during the time leading up to this election, she worked timelessly in recruiting superb Republican candidates and showing them what they had to do to win, and that we did. In fact, throughout the state, there have been countless Republican wins, and that's what we're focusing on tonight, because that is carrying our state, one of the leading states in the Republican Party, to victory. And we need it, the country needs it, we hope to concentrate on that. She holds a BA degree in Spanish and a minor in international relations from the University of Illinois. And she is an RN from Parkland College. She is married to Dr. John Parks, a retired anesthesiologist. And together they have a family of five children and 12 grandchildren. And one of her sons is sitting there. Can you stand up, Pierce? There he is. A fine young man. And now I'd like to welcome, and let's give her a warmly welcome, Kat Parks, our vice chair. Actually, nonverbal. And here we enter the political world 
and we hear words, words, and words, and not necessarily the amount of action that we need to see to have positive things change. So that's how I re-entered the political world. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about my story and how I came to Texas. I'm not, a, I'm not an OP. <laughs> um, but I also didn't grow up here. Thankfully, uh, I did marry a Texan. I am raising a Texan. Uh, but, and I always want to say it a little quietly. Uh, I grew up in Illinois, <laughs> which everyone associates with Barack Obama. <laughs> so I, I have to remind people that Ronald Reagan also came from Illinois. So, so there are some good things that come out of that state as well. But my, my first time coming to Texas was a life-changing event. And it's when I knew that someday I would come back to Texas and that hopefully someday I would be able to give back to Texas what Texas gave to me. And when I was 13 years old, I entered an essay contest. And I won third prize in an essay contest that was put on by the American Quarter Horse Association out in Amarillo, Texas. And the first three winners of this essay contest received a fully funded trip to Amarillo to visit their quarter horse museum <laughs> and to follow their executive board and to meet with their executive board to talk about doing business in Texas. And the first question was they had not anticipated that a 13 year old would write an essay that would be capable of, of winning the top three prizes. And so the discussion was to my parents, can she get on a plane by herself and come out here? We want her if you let her do it. And my mom said, send her. Send her, this will be the greatest thing. So the gentleman out there brought me into their executive board and for three days they treated me as if I were a Texan. And they included me in every single discussion as if I were an adult. And it was something that I had never experienced before and it's something that my son Pierce, who is 10, is getting to live, and part of the reason that we came back here, because we knew we wanted him to live in that atmosphere, because there is something about Texas where we believe in the power of the individual and the rugged individualism that anything is possible in Texas, and that's true. And this is how I find myself getting back involved in politics. I grew up in a political family. We were Republicans in Illinois although my father did lose his political position in 1992. Uh, the Beto blue wave was not the first blue wave that's ever happened. In 1992, we had the Clinton blue wave, and all of the downstate and all of the down ballot Republicans were wiped out. And when I was 10 years old, that meant my father lost his job. So I have experienced politics from a young age, but I got busy in school and, uh, and having a family, and I didn't get back involved in things until we owned a business out in New Mexico, in Santa Fe, some of you may know Santa Fe. And Santa Fe is a socialist country. And Santa Fe is a wonderful place to go visit restaurants, and it's a terrible place to own a business, and it's an even worse place to raise a child. And um, just so you know, I have something in common with, uh, with Trent. Uh, I'm a little bit of a nerd. There you go, Trent. <laughs> Um, and I got involved in reading, they were proposing a new Sustainable Land and Development Act out there and how it was going to affect your private property rights. And it was 800 pages long and I started reading it and I started realizing all the ways that gov governments could put small laws in that were going to end industry, that were going to end the way that people put food on their tables. And the people who got to decide, frankly, frequently knew nothing about the industries they were seeking to regulate. That right there is the difference between a Democrat and a Republican. Because a Democrat believes that the federal government has the authority and the ability to make better decisions for individuals than individuals can make for themselves. If we as Republicans were better spreading that message, there would be so few Democrats. Especially when we look at where do we have problems, and this is at the state level. We say the suburban women didn't turn out. The suburban women didn't turn out because they didn't like Trump, because Trump offended them. 
The suburban women didn't turn out and are not turning out for Republicans because we're not doing a good job of letting them know that conservatives believe in their ability to make decisions as individuals over what Democrats believe. And that has to change. So I got back involved in politics in 2017. 2017, my husband and my neighbor were standing on the porch drinking whiskey. And the neighbor said, you know, Judy, our county chairwoman, has been doing this for 10 years. She's getting tired of it. She's old. And we're ready to find somebody new. You know anybody who will do it? And my husband threw me right under that bus. And he said, well, Kat, it'd be great if you could get her to do it. So I became a county chairman at my very first Republican meeting in the state of Texas. Even though I've been a lifelong Republican and voted Republican my entire life. Why am I sharing this story with you? Because for Texas to continue to excel, to succeed and to be run by conservatives and to be run by Republicans, we have to invite new people in. And they are out there. And they share our values. And they vote the right way. When they know when it's time to vote, when we communicate to them that it's time to vote. Because people who are between 30 and 15 years old are busy and they are in the rat race of their lives, and they are raising their children, and they miss the dates and the deadlines, and where is the polling location. And so these are the areas where we can make the absolute greatest difference with education. So education and communication are the two things that I hold very dear, and those are the two things that I went forward with. To talk a little bit about, uh, about what Joan spoke of, I was placed in charge of candidate recruitment two years ago. And candidate recruitment, some of you will be interested to know, had never been done on a statewide level in Texas. In fact, we had no idea how many Republicans we had in office on a statewide level versus how many Democrats we had in office on a statewide level. And we found out, because I went through every single county in the state of Texas, and I looked up every single one of them, okay? So I went through, and previous chairman, James Dickey, said, Cap, we lose 100% of the races that we don't have anyone running in. And so we have got to start looking in some of these counties, in some of these blue counties, where statistically, the chances aren't very good. And this is a double-edged sword. In Collin County, if I want to be a donor to a candidate in Collin County, there's a pretty good chance that my candidate as a Republican is going to get elected and I might have an ability to have a conversation or some influence down the line. But if my Republican candidate lives in a Hispanic area along the border where Republicans win 27% of the vote, who will support them when all of the people who are in office are Democrats and the Democrat machine? So this was a very difficult, um, impossible task, frankly. Uh, to go down and to do. Um, what we did was we created regional directors in each of the metropolitan areas, so Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, San Antonio, <coughs> Houston, and then we added El Paso and the Rio Grande Valley, the bluest areas. And so I'm very pleased, this is my second visit to Collin County. I never got to visit Collin County because you all have it so good. In fact, if, if, I had to, if I had to label your executive director, your county chairman, you are functioning easily in the top 2% of the state with the things that you're doing. And it's, it's amazing. It is amazing. Your ballot board, who's running your ballot board, and Ben, who I've lost now in the audience, but who's running these numbers, here we are. Elections are simple math. Don't let anyone tell you any different. It is 50% plus one wins the race. And so some of your most valuable people in this field are the people who break down the numbers and who figure out the math because they tell you where you need to go to make up the difference. So um, we can nerd out about numbers later, but I, we are, we're in good company. So, so, some exciting things came from candidate recruitment, and we didn't know. It had never been done, so I developed the manual, and I, we wrote the program, and we forged ahead. And we recruited 3,800 Republicans to run on the primary ticket. We did not recruit any Republicans to run against other Republicans. We just recruited Republicans to run against Democrats that were in office. 
to the Democrats recruiting 1,400. It was a significant success. Part of the reason this is so important is the outreach that candidates themselves and their spheres of influence have within their communities. You all have an outstanding community that you've built here. I heard from, from Ted that when he took office as president, there were 60 to 70 members, and now there are over 400 members. That's because of each one of you who have a conversation with someone and invite them to come to events like these. And the people you know and that you touch, it has to be fun. And we have to remember that as we do these political things. That I heard a great analogy, uh, this is from Jason Ross, who's in SD2, who is close to you guys. And, um, he was the previous SRAC, and he said, Kat, you know the problem with the Republican Party is he said, sometimes we tend to be like those neighbors, that next door you can hear them screaming at one another over the fence, and they're yelling, and they're miserable to be around, and then they want to invite you over for a barbecue. <laughs> Do you want to go? <laughs> we have to be careful. We have to be careful. And we've been a dominant Republican state for so long, I think sometimes that we have lost that perspective. So, so at any rate, we recruited tremendous numbers, and we recruited um, we recruited uh, Republicans for every single congressional seat. We doubled the number of females who ran for congressional seats. It was a tremendous success. In fact, national national news media outlets started calling and saying, "Wait, what happened in Texas? How did how did this happen?" And we recruited the highest number of females who have ever run in the state of Texas, the highest number of minorities, and the highest number of people under the age of 40. And I'll tell you the secret to success was simply find someone that you respect, that you like, that you look up to, that you'd like to have be a leader for, who's already within your community, and have a conversation with them. All of you, all of you out here, one of the things that I like to say is the Republican Party of Texas, it is not an office in Austin. And if it was just reduced to the office in Austin that exists, it would not be successful at all. It is every single person in this room, it is the contacts that you make. It is the power that you have through your connections. So if you know someone, someone I was sitting with at the table tonight was saying, we have young granddaughters. and. They're really excited about things right now. Where do we plug them in? And I said, actually, and this is for any of you, uh, there's an organization called Turning Point USA. And they are having something called the Student Action Summit. It's in Florida. It's the week before Christmas. Uh, Turning Point USA has some of the top conservative speakers in the country. Tucker Carlson will be there. They were frequently bringing the Trump children to come speak. It, it's really Tim Scott, um, I know Nikki Haley has spoken in the past. It's really wonderful. And they want to make it affordable for these kids. So the cost for them to attend a three-day conference at a top-notch hotel is $30. Oh, yeah. $30. So if any of you have, and I'll just throw this in as a side note, if any of you have grandchildren, nieces, nephews, friends who have them, the only thing that the people who attend are responsible, it's for people between the ages of 15 and 25, is they have that $30 cost. Frankly, if they need a sponsorship because they can't afford that, we will find somebody to sponsor them. They just have to get there. They're responsible for their food and they're responsible for their travel. And it is, it is state of the art. And so I will share that information with Ted so that he can put that out to all of you. There's a simple online application process, but um, I've been speaking with the Texas representative, and anyone from the state of Texas who wants to go will be admitted to go. So it's things like that, where we have conversations, where we invite people in, where we connect people with resources. One of the things that we realized as we started doing candidate recruiting was that the greatest barrier to having people run for office is you can be brilliant, successful, the top of your game in your career and your, your life, and it is not the same thing as running for office. The worlds are not the same. And so we needed to add more education. So we brought in an organization, some of you may have heard of it, called the Leadership Institute. They are based in Maryland. 
They are the gold standard for conservative education in the United States. And I had a conversation with them, and I said, what do you think? You think you could bring in some, some instructors and help us do some training in Texas? And they said, we've never done anything like that before. And I said, Texas is the place to start. Everything's bigger and better in Texas. And they said, all right, here we go. So they did, and they ended up bringing in over 70 instructors. We did 30 schools. We trained 1,400 Republicans on how to run for office. And so thinking of things like that, that are outside the box. Someone at, frequently I get asked the question, what do you do as vice chair? Well, I do the same thing that I did as the chair of candidate recruitment, and I do the same thing that I did when I became a county chairman, and that's that I look around the room and I have questions, and I am curious, and I want to know answers to things. And so when I ask those questions and there aren't answers, have any of you volunteers ever realized that Apparently, when you ask a question, it's the same equivalent to raising your hand and saying, I'll do it. <laughs> okay? So, so that is how I've gotten myself involved in this, having gotten started in 2017. Now, the state of Texas, I need to tell you, um, I attribute our wins to three things. And this is me personally, my personal feedback. The candidate recruitment that we did, let me just tell you, um, Part of what pays off when you recruit people to run, even in difficult districts. We had a gentleman by the name of Mauro Garza run in CD20, which is near San Antonio. It's considered an extremely difficult district. He did not win. He knocked on over 80,000 doors. That's 80,000 people that he made contact with with the Republican message that had we not had a candidate run for that office, no one would have had conversations with any of those folks about what a conservative is or what conservative policies are. Johnny T. ran for CD9. He also did not win. I can look at every single congressional race where they didn't win, percentages increased, but they had communication, they got in those communities, and they made a difference where, honestly, for over a decade, Republicans have just not even ventured into those areas. So that was revolutionary to do that. Johnny Teague's team knocked on over 60,000 doors as of July. So I'm sure he exceeded the 80,000 mark as well. The second thing that we did, and many of you know about Carl Rove and Steve Ministeri working on the voter engagement project, where they registered voters, they ended up registering over 200,000 new voters in the state of Texas. It is crucial. That is a program that hopefully we've learned how important that is, and hopefully something that continues to go on. Um, I live, my small community it is very, very rural, very red meat, and frankly, some of them don't like Carl Grove. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I had a very frank conversation with him, and I said, that man got more done, and through his work, through his effort, through him sharing his brain power, I don't care if you like him or not, you like him now because of what he's done for Texas to help us in this 2020 election. And that is the truth. That is the truth that I'll tell you. And then the third thing, the candidates that we recruited, they worked. They worked so hard. And so many of you worked so hard to support them. And if you didn't send texts or make phone calls or knock doors, you donated. And it was incredibly important. And we saw our our representatives who were in safe districts, we saw them donate to representatives who were not in safe districts. And these are the things, these are the conversations that don't take place in the media. The media will not give credit for these things. Um, Texas fought incredibly hard. I think Ted was telling me that the estimate was that over $200 million poured into Texas. It is incredible that we did Flip some, we traded some congressional seats, but we did not lose any congressional seats. And most importantly, we held our state house. We did not lose any seats. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is Texas's greatest win. And I will tell you why. Because the third thing, our, our, I had three goals. I wanted President Trump to be elected in Texas. I wanted our, to hold control of our redistricting. And I wanted to protect our judges. And as you all know, you lost your appellate judges. Yes. And we are seeing this trend across the state. We've lost all of our judges in Houston. 
uh, all of them in 2016, all of them in 2018. This was another bloodbath here in Houston, in Dallas. It's very, very challenging. And we have got to look at redistricting. And we've got to look at ways to help our judges. And I will be honest with you, as of right now, I don't have all the answers. I did start an initiative to recruit people to run for the district courts. Um, I happened to sit next to Supreme Court Justice Jeff Boyd in an airport. <laughs> I introduced myself, and um, as a result of, of that divine intervention, um, Jeff Boyd and I started a tour around the state recruiting district judges and telling people his story of how he ended up getting involved. Um, and, and so I just want to share a lot of these personal stories with you because what is the future direction of Texas? I'm going to tell you one thing, and we have to be very careful. I also am in a very red county. It's rural, it's certainly smaller demographics. I don't have people moving in like you all do here in Collin County. But we have to be very careful not to fall asleep because Texas is no longer safe at, at all. And the number of volunteers who worked uh, I think I went to the TFRW Tribute for Women, I think that was two days ago, and they wrote over 40,000 postcards to individuals. They sent over 30,000 handwritten letters. I can't tell you how many hundreds of thousands up into the millions of phone calls that were being made. I also have to give tremendous credit to John Cornyn's campaign. John Cornyn's campaign worked and did amazing things to protect all the people down ballot. So I bring good news and I bring bad news. <laughs> the good news is um, we made it against tremendous odds. Uh, and it was because we worked. And we worked as a state and everyone truly did their part. The bad news going, and, and I hope it would be really, really nice if the infusion of Democrat money stops pouring into Texas. Yes. However, they see, they see that they take Texas and they own the country. So the likelihood of it stopping is probably not likely. And this is where, um, yes, I am from Illinois, but I love Texas dearly. And for all of you have to know that to all Republicans who live in desperately blue states who hate it. This is Camelot. <laughs> and if Texas doesn't stay here, there is no more Camelot in the United States. So what happens with the Republican Party going forward? Um, as someone said, the ballots are not certified statewide yet. Once they become certified, we do deep dives into numbers. And we look at a lot of things. I'll tell you one congressional race that was a very surprising race. It's very exciting. And some of you may have seen um, the Rio Grande Valley had the most significant turn from being so far blue to falling into the red. Uh, everyone was shocked. In fact, Star County and Maverick County had where they were 60 points to the negative, to the blue and are now five points to the positive for the red. That is shocking, y'all. That is incredible. And, this, and, and I have to tell you that this um, Turning Point USA Student Action Summit, um, I am sponsoring a young man. The county chairman in Maverick County is a young man by the name of Freddie Ariano. Remember that name. He is 19 years old. And Freddie became the youngest county chairman in the state of Texas. And I met Freddie, and I was really excited um, because he showed me behind his door, um, he had a list of all their voter turnout and of their percentages, of their increases for the 2018 cycle. And I said, he gets it, he gets it. And the, the numbers, they saw 10 to 20 percentage point jumps in every single one of their precincts. And he knows every single precinct where it happened. He knows the people who made it happen. And that is what we are going to have to 
buckle down in Texas and get back to that. We've, we've been allowed to be a little lazy. It's been pretty good, things have been conservative, but we're gonna have to buckle back down to those numbers. You all, I saw the numbers for this community. Y'all, y'all are incredible. I mean, absolutely incredible. We need you to start sharing these ideas with your surrounding communities. Uh, because the fight is real. And um, any of you out here remember a gentleman by the name of Barry Goldwater? Yeah. Okay, so I'm a huge Barry Goldwater fan. And Barry Goldwater, I'm actually a millennial, so Barry Goldwater is before my time. But as you heard, I have grandchildren, so I have a husband who is much older than I am, and he was actually a Barry Goldwater fan back when Barry Goldwater came through Texas. And um, so I've read his biographies and, and all of these things. And, and I would just like to end with the greatest statement that this right now is the separation between the Democrats and the Republicans. And Barry Goldwater said, a government powerful enough to give you everything you want is strong enough to take it all away. So, believe in freedom, believe in the individual, and continue the good work that you're doing because it matters, because what you're doing matters, and the state of Texas thanks you for that. Thank you very much. Trump votes out there. 
That shows up in the statistics. Our Texas legislature, uh, again, while some, nice, some places have changed, the numbers haven't changed at all in the House. We did lose one uh, Senate seat. What's interesting about that seat, it's along the Rio Grande Valley, uh, Senator Flores here. We won the congressional district there. That's Will Hurt's old district. That was a, one of those districts that was questionable whether whether Republican could ever win again. We've got a great Republican candidate. He won, but we lost the Senate race there. But still, oops, went back too far. We still have 18 good, solid Republican senators to control the Senate and the House as we face redistricting uh, this year. That will be very important as we move forward. And by the way, I believe Senator Paxton is on the redistricting committee from, from, the, from the Senate. Candy, you know who it is from the House, but I don't remember. Jeff Leach. Jeff Leach is on the House. So we are well represented in the redistricting committee uh, in the Texas legislature. Well, the red wave continued. If you look down ballot at all the the statewide races for railroad commissioners, Supreme Court, Court of Appeals, it looked very, very similar to John Cornyn's race, winning with 54% and almost five, almost 5.9 million votes. So those were good, solid wins. However, as, as Kat Park said, you get down to the fifth Court of Appeals, and those justices' races, uh, we did well in Collin County in, pre in our precinct, but we could not outvote the Democrats in Dallas County. In those three races, you see a total, you know, an average of those races of 740,000. Each race was lost by 89,000 votes. So I'm sitting back scratching my head saying, where are we gonna get 90,000 votes to overturn the Democrats? Our Collin County margin was 60,000 votes, but 31,000 Collin County people, voters, did not vote in this race. Now, can we win all 31,000 of those? I'd like to think so. Probably not. But that's 31,000 people who went to the polls in these, this race, these three races, who did not cast a vote. So we had work to do. You couldn't find three better qualified candidates for the fifth court of appeals than what we had. So we got work to do. Our Collin County legislators, if you start looking at those races, and I'll start at the bottom with Candy Noble. Yay. Yeah. Yay. Candy won 59% of the vote. Van Taylor, who's our representative, won 55%. And you can see they did quite well in, in Precinct 179. What I want to point out to you is the other races in the county. Justin Holland, Scott Sanford, all won their races like Candy did with about 60% 60, 60 of the vote. Not so with Jeff Leach and Matt Shaheen. Jeff won with a 51.8% margin. That's 3,246 votes out of 94,000 cast. That was a close race. Matt Shaheen's race was even closer. He won. There were three people in that race, but he came out on top. He won by 849 votes out of 85,000 guests. Now the good news is, 
That more than doubled his winning margin from two years ago. And as y'all well know, Matt and Jeff and their campaigns worked real hard. We were fortunate enough to help Matt with the postcard mailing. I, I will tell you that I fell short of our prediction. I told Matt that he was going to win by 5,327 <laughs> votes, because that's how many postcards we see. <laughs> but he did win, so we're glad he won. We have a good, solid, set of legislators from Collin County. The remaining races in Collin County, if you put together all the district court judges and, and Ken Mom's race for tax assessor, all those races look pretty much the same. We've got 260,000 votes with the 57% winning margin. Those down ballot races were supported very well. Uh, Daryl Hale, we had to leave a few minutes ago. Darrell won his race handily with over 60% of the vote. If you look at the races with no opposition, I put them up here because it's interesting. The sheriff and two of the district court judges got just a little more than 300,000 votes. Uh, Mike Vance, who will be our new constable, got 47,000. But if you add up all the other four, con three constables to uh, uh, Mike's, it comes up to 300,000 votes. So if you ran a post in Collin County, you got 300,000 votes. My question to ourselves is, what happened to the 40,000 votes? Why didn't our candidates up here get 40,000 more votes. I don't know the answer to that question, but that's one we've got to answer going forward to improve our margins, because the Democrats are gonna run candidates in Collin County from now on. The bottom line, somebody asked me what are we celebrating tonight? We're celebrating because Collin County, our precinct in Texas is strong, and it's red. We still have work to do, but we have something to celebrate. Our Christmas party is going to be on December 7th. Okay. Uh, 
for all of us uh, who have gray hair, we can remember what that date means. So uh, it's going to be a, a very interesting party put on. We're going to have, have a celebration not only for the Christmas holidays, uh, but also for Pearl Harbor. So uh, I would ask you again to get your reservations as quickly as possible. Um, we're looking at uh, starting at 5.30 again, uh, dinner at 6.15, and uh, there are the Program Planning Committee uh, with Jane Siller, Joan, and Ben, and the remainder of the board are putting together uh, a number of contests. Uh, I will give you a little insight for those of you who have your masks. Uh, start designing them, start, uh, start create, becoming creative with them, okay? And so there will be surprises for that as well. Uh, our events, upcoming events, uh, in Collin County, uh, the Collin County uh, Republican Party has got their, uh, their website. Uh, as you all know by now, uh, the club has a website. I would invite you to go there. Uh, that website, for those of you who go to websites, sometimes you find the same old information, the same old information. Uh, okay. Georgina Fosek does an incredible job on refreshing that website, okay? Uh, and I can tell you, she does that almost on a daily basis. So, uh, there is something there every day that's a little different than was there the last time you looked. Uh, again, I think it's extremely important for trying to communicate uh, with you as well as we can. I would also suggest that you, uh, for friends of yours who are not members or for family members, all right, who you'd like to keep abreast of what's going on with the Republican Party uh, in Collin County and in Texas, okay? Uh, you'll find a lot of very useful information on that website. Uh, hopefully, uh, maybe we may be able to turn some of them into uh, active participants of the Republican Party. And then we also have our email, all right? Uh, we instituted that as a way of communications as well. Uh, so uh, please use those. Uh, I would like to thank everybody for joining us this evening. I'd like to thank uh, Kat, and I'd like to thank uh, Trent. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Kat's uh, campaign manager, her son, so he can stand up. I'd like you all to uh, stand and give them a, a Heritage Ranch in Texas Great Book. Thank you for coming on.